we have not produced liberty, equality, and fraternity. Nothing close to it. So it is important to understand that Marx's particular take in economics is driven by, is motivated by, a sense that capitalism needs to be analyzed to understand why it hasn't been able to do what its proponents had hoped and promised in their enthusiasm. So it's not a dismissal out of some cheap shot of I don't like you, or I didn't make a lot of money, or I didn't, it has nothing to do with that. The irony is, and part of the appeal of Marxism has always been to people who believe in liberty, equality, and, and fraternity, because they feel a kindred spirit in Marx, and they're right. That was his motivation, and it led him to be a critic of capitalism. Let me turn then to how this criticism became in Marx a systematic theory. Because it's one thing to be critical of capitalism. For example, you can notice uh, that rich and poor are widely separated, or you can notice that some people have a lot of power and others have very little, things like that. Th those are observations, those are valuable, but that's not a theory. That doesn't explain how and why capitalism should work like that, as opposed to how it had been promised it would work. So Marx began by saying, I want to see what everybody else has understood about economics. I want to learn from everybody who went before me, even recognizing that many of them like capitalism and not critical, but they, nonetheless, he did what I said at the beginning today. He did what you ought to do. You study everybody so you can understand the system. So if you read, for example, the theories of surplus value, you'll see Marx devoting hundreds of pages to analyzing the works of Adam Smith or David Ricardo, or countless people whose politics could not have been further from his own. And I ask you to compare that to modern day non-Marxist and anti-Marxist professors of the sort who dominate the American university. They haven't a clue. It is embarrassing for me when I appear on panels with them, and go to conferences with them, which I do fairly often, that I really can't have a conversation one way or the other because they are simply unfamiliar with the Marxist literature. They never had anyone teach it to them in school. Their careers never rewarded learning this stuff. Uh, indeed, it would have hampered their careers to be seen as interested in it. And so they simply do not know. A problem for them that is particularly acute now, that capitalism has having its second global breakdown in 75 years, when it would be really useful to know a little bit about criticisms of a system that is breaking down, rather than to be nothing but a cheerleader who therefore doesn't have much to say when your team is down 802. Okay. Here's how Marx went at it. He said, that as I look at other theorists, and I look at how they examine capitalism, and how they come to see it and use their understanding to come up with explanations for what happens, to come up with proposals for what the government should do, and so on, that they have a very particular way of looking at the, point, at the issue. And here, as Marx works this out, he draws heavily on his philosophical training, and in particular, his greatest teacher, the teacher who taught philosophy to the entire generation of his time, a famous German philosopher named Hegel, H-E-G-E-L. And he took from Hegel the idea that human thought is always, in a way, a struggle of people who see things differently. In other words, if you ask someone to explain the motion of the planets, or why plants grow, or why it rains under certain circumstances, if you look far and wide, you will quickly discover that there are multiple different theories around to explain that. And it's not surprising, because we're different one person from the other, and we look at the world differently. We don't see the same things when we look at the world. I used to do a little experiment in my classroom where I would teach this to students, and I'll describe it to you now. 
I would ask students to please look around the room, the classroom where we were sitting, and write down on a piece of paper a paragraph with what they see. And then I would collect the pieces of paper and I would begin reading to them. And very quickly, the class understood we don't see the same things. One student would begin writing about the clothing that different people in the room were wearing. That's what they saw. Another one didn't say a word about clothing, was fixated on the architecture of the room, how it was designed, the shape. Another one didn't talk about the room or the other students, talked about me as the teacher. That was what they saw. Another one talked about expressions on people's face, but not me or the architecture or the clothing. In other words, to answer the question, what do you see, depends less on what there is and more on who you are. What in your life made you respond to my instruction? Tell me what you see by looking there. Moreover, if your mind is focused on clothing, you're going to not see architecture. It's not because it isn't there. And it's not even that you're not interested in architecture. It's just that you look in a certain way. The same thing happens when you try to ask people to explain what they think about less tangible things. I'll give you a, an example that may remind you of moments in your own life. The concept love. You're there with your significant other in a very dimly lit little restaurant having a wonderful conversation. And either you say to him or her, or she says to him, whatever, I love you. At which point a very difficult moment begins to develop. Because over the next few weeks and months, or if you're not careful, over the rest of your life, you're going to discover with that person that you don't mean the same thing with these two words. With these one word, excuse me, you're two people. You each bring your unique ways of thinking, imagining, hoping, dreaming, analyzing to this concept. What he meant when he said it, and what you understood when you heard it, those are not the same thing. They can't be. You and that other person are completely different. You had different mothers and fathers, you grew up in a different community, you had different experiences. How in the world would you ever come to see things the same way? You don't. You can't. Therefore, human beings, particularly in, in large communities, always develop multiple different ways of understanding what's going on. Sometimes, one among the several ways that people have becomes so dominant that either everybody, for some peculiar reason, decides to think that way, or what also sometimes happens is that, the, that one perspective represses or suppresses the others, punishes people who believe in a, some other way. You all know of examples when, for example, one concept of what God is kills people with a different concept. That's very popular and has been for a long time. So Marx begins as a student of Hegel with the presumption that, of course, Different people will develop different economic theories. Just like it is no way strange that a family with three children will quickly discover that the three children don't have the same view of the family. They were not all born at the same time. They were born at different times. Mama and Papa were different people when each of them was born. It's that their, their actual experience of the family is different. So it would be much more bizarre for them to have the same view, and much more suspect, than it would be for them to have a different view. But different views frighten a lot of people. Because if you live in a world of the sort many of you may live in, you believe without ever having questioned it, that if there are multiple ways of thinking about something, one of them is the right way, and the other ones are the wrong way. That is a very deeply ingrained assumption in our culture. And it's one that Hegel didn't agree with, that Marx didn't agree with, and that I think if you worry about it a bit, 
you will probably not long agree with it either. Let me drive the point home as follows. First, suppose I asked you the question, what's the right way to eat a meal? Is it with a knife and fork or is it with chopsticks? You would resent, I would guess, the question. You would say to me, what do you mean the right way? These are just different ways. They come out of different cultures. They have different qualities. It's a somewhat different experience to eat with a knife and fork as compared with chop. But the question, right or wrong, is the wrong question. It's like asking me, which is heavier, Monday or Friday? You, you wouldn't spend a lot of time struggling with the answer because you think the question is nonsensical, right? And for a Hegelian or a Marxian, the question, what's the right theory, is similarly senseless. Theories are different. A Buddhist, compared to a Catholic, we're not going to have a conversation which has got the right take on religion. They have different takes on religion. Okay, I would only ask you to apply the exact same logic if I say to you, look, there's a Marxist critical way of understanding capitalism, and there's a mainstream celebratory way. These are different theories, they develop in different ways, and, but if I ask you which one is right or wrong, my hope is that you would at least understand why a Marxist finds that question senseless. They're different. They come out of different needs, different feelings, different experiences. I already gave you some of the dimensions of Marx's life that ended up making him interested in critical approach to capitalism as a system. With his critical approach, one of the things Marx focused on early in his life and that came to shape his economics was one particular aspect of capitalism that he found odious, that he found fundamentally incompatible with liberty, equality, and fraternity. Um, here's that dimension. It has to do with labor and work. In Marx's view, modern capitalist societies were structurally, constitutionally unable to provide equality, fraternity, and liberty because of the way they organized work. On the crudest and simplest level, one group of people worked very, very hard, and another group of people didn't work at all. On the other hand, and another way of saying it, some people produced an awful lot more than they got, which enabled a whole lot of other people who didn't produce anything at all to live off that extra that those who worked produced. He noticed this because he noticed this as a jarring contradiction to liberty, equality, and fraternity. How are you going to have equality if people, some people spend all of their waking hours working and other people don't, don't even have to think about it? How are you going to get liberty if some people, in order to survive, have to work like that? How much liberty do they have and what does their liberty mean if they're too exhausted from so many hours of work and low pay for that work that they have neither the time nor the interest nor the energy to go out and inform themselves about civic affairs or participate in cultural activities, etc. So Marx, at an early age, became really interested in labor. And so his studies were shaped by an interest in the inequality, let's call it, of the whole way labor is organized. And eventually, it became a kind of hallmark of Marxist thinking about capitalism and about other systems. That he began to realize that not only was he interested in the organization of labor, but that other people, who had studied economics weren't interested in it, hadn't studied it. Let me again give you a metaphor. Suppose somebody was trying